Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're here on Thursday morning uh, to, to, to get a preview, I think, of S226. So David, if you could join us um, and just so committee S226 is, um, it says it's relating to expanding access to safe and affordable housing. It's an omnibus bill that is actually still on the Senate floor. Um, David, I think what I'd like us to do is really between you and when Ellen comes is first of all, I wanna acknowledge what I've heard through the grapevine is that you've been exceedingly busy on this and the and all of the other um, commerce bills that have been floating around. We haven't seen you at all, but <laughs> I, I just want to, I know we'll see you more in this last few weeks of the sessions, but I, I just want to acknowledge that you've been, I don't know if you've been at wit's end, but you've been at burning the candle at both ends on these bills. So, um, so for committee, I just want to reemphasize this bill is not complete because it hasn't passed through the Senate. While it is on by the title about housing, there are many different areas that yeah. and committees that this bill will touch. But for today, I'd just like to have as broad, you know, I don't want to dig too deeply quite yet. I just want to understand the concepts that are in the bill thus far. And um, because we'll start, depending on where this bill, I'm assuming that it's going to come to us, but the clerk may decide differently, um, at least initially. So um, before we start digging into the work, into the, into the bill, I would just wanted to have us to have a broader understanding um, and then Dave, as, as the bill progresses through the Senate, you know, David, I would just ask that we have a summary, um, an updated summary as soon as we can, just to see what's why. Yes, Representative Pango. Um, if you didn't already say this, which I didn't think you did, House Natural Resources is also taking testimony on this bill yesterday, I believe, and mm -hmm. today. Yeah. So, so they definitely touching other committees. Well, for those of us who are on the on the committee in fall of 2020, <laughs> the, we had in that September session, we had a bill from, I think it was 256 um, that came from the Senate that was about a lot of the zoning stuff. And what we learned as hard as we worked on it, Fish and Wildlife Natural Resources came and said, wait, this is our bill. And it was, it was taken from the Act 250 bill that was imploding or exploding at the time. And it was and, and it was germane to our committee in the fact that it was housing, but the nuance of it was, it was not even a nuance, the, the, the focus of it was zoning. And we got some of that bill, we were able to extract some of it, but rightfully the Fish and Wildlife and Natural Resources said, well, we should be making, you know, this is our portfolio. So if you look at the summary, if you look at that, if you saw that that, that natural resources was already hearing it, they're hearing this portion of the bill that has to do with zoning that has also been H511, which it's also part of, there's elements of it that might be in the Act 250 bill. So what I, what I as a chair learned in 2020, when I saw this stuff is like, we're not gonna work on this bill we're, gonna, we're not going to invest the amount of time that we spent in the fall of 2020 to have this yanked from us at the last minute. I would rather be proactive. And so as we move forward, we'll talk with leadership and other house chairs because it's not a drive-by bill. And I will, uh, I will lay that right out front. So <laughs> this being the end of the biennium, who knows how this bill is going, what it's going to look like when, if it has to go to different committees but there are elements of it that are um, that have been called poison pills that have been subject to negotiation with the administration or with the Senate. There's pieces in this bill that we really like, like to be, you know, that we want to get across. But stuff like tax credits, um, while we will get a facility with them, I think Ways and Means should have more than an hour 
or two for a drive by. So anyway, we're it, this is going to be this particular bill in conjunction with 211. I'm not going to prognosticate and say that there's going to be one, two, or three bills that come out of this because I don't know yet. That's part of our work, you know, of just saying, do we, it, but it's the end of the biennium. We're going to be, you know, we have to make sure that the issues that we're dealing with, we deal with correctly and, and fit them in and deal with them um, in a way that we're comfortable with. But we're just starting now, I think, with, with this overview um, so that you, you, you'll identify which sections uh, I'm talking about here. And, and, and we will take testimony on them, but I do think that, that the relevant committees will also be taking testimony on them too uh, in advance. So, yes, Representative Clark. So if, if we are given possession of this bill, uh, would then Fish and Wildlife suggest an amendment to this committee for this bill as it moves forward if they if they have well again it, the language <clears throat> variations on the same language exist in a couple of different forms uh -huh. one is in s234 which is the act 250 but i don't know okay got it okay so they could conceivably lift a section out and put it someplace else that's that follows protocol as an amendment, um, they could suggest changes to be part of S-226 to keep S-226 whole is what it passed the Senate. Um, so it could happen, it could happen in a bunch of different ways and decisions will be made here and above my pay grade on how we move forward with some of this, but it will be, um, again, we will make sure that when we make a decision on or when a decision is made for us, whatever happens, um, that we are fully knowledgeable of that decision. Okay. So with all of that as a preface, um, welcome, David. Did Ron make you a, a co-host yet? Or no, you're not on the screen. I don't know if you want to be a co-host or not, but um I, I'm not I'm not signed into the Zoom meeting at all. So I don't can't be a co-host. Okay. Unless you want me to be a physical co-host. <laughs> There's drinks over there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's not for us to be here. We're talking about friends. <laughs> Coffee and pastries. Uh, um, good morning, David Hall, Legislative Council. We are talking about S226. And as the chair indicated, this is uh um, complicated, multifaceted bill, which could describe all of the bills I've been working on this year. <laughs> um, this one does not hold the record for the most uh, committees involved. That actually goes to H703, but... Uh, <laughs> and we were one of those. <laughs> so, remarkably, we were like the only committee who <laughs> didn't have a piece of that. The chair of that committee was on the floor last week saying, and we worked with this committee and that committee and this committee. <laughs> not, not it's not too late, so... <laughs> If you've got ideas, we've still got hundreds of pages of room. And, and that's the bill that looks like a uh, Rockefeller Center from the distance in shape and separate, you know, just sort of so many lights on it. Twinkling all the way through the process. Um, so, uh, you know, half of this bill is Ellen's bill because half of this bill relates to Act 250 and zoning. And, um, I can't really tell you a whole lot about what she's doing over there in zoning world in Act 250 land because that's not my, on my long list of problems, that's not one of them. So, uh, regrettably, I mean, I can like give you a one sentence. No, let's, let's let Ellen describe what's going on in the, in the Act 250 section because that's, I don't want you to be sure. in a position of, of guessing. That's probably good. Um, so I'm um, seeing how far that takes us. That really takes us all the way to page 11. So by the way, the document that I'm looking at, which I sent to this committee and to Ron and to Ellen, and I believe Ron posted is um, just the, the version of S226 that is up for third reading. So 
It is the bills that came out of Senate Economic Development. There's a finance report that said it should pass as proposed by Senate Economic Development. It went to appropriations where they do what they usually do, which is remove things that have uh, monetary impact, though they did not remove all of them. Um, and then there was actually another um, amendment from the floor from members of Senate Economic Development that changed uh, the contractor registry <coughs> section of the bill. So let me start on page 11 of that document that I prepared, which is informal, unofficial. Um, it relates to the seat of first generation home buyers. But where this lands is in 32 VSA 5930U. So that is the affordable housing uh, tax credit, the VHFA runs. And within that, part of what they can do with that money is a down payment assistance. You're probably all very familiar with that, but they sell these tax credits, raise a pot of money, have statutory authority to conduct this down payment assistance program. And that is right now open to what are, um, you know, in the program called first time home buyers it actually means it tracks that federal definition where you're a first time home buyer since you haven't owned a home in three years. And that's all it takes. Well, it's three years and it's, <clears throat> and it's income requirements and Yes. Um, and you can use those loans for down payment, closing costs, or both, right? So all that is the same until we get to page 12, and you'll see this new subdivision D. And this says that the agency, so VHFA, may reserve funding and adopt guidelines to provide grants to first time home buyers who are also first generation home buyers. So that is one sentence that has lots of new ideas for this program, right? So remember right now, down payment assistance program is a loan that revolves when the house is sold or refinanced and it comes back to the agency to make more loans to first time home buyers to help them with their closing costs or down payments. So with this addition of this one sentence now, uh, there's no new money, but the agency may reserve funding and it doesn't say how much, and it can adopt guidelines to provide grants, not loans, to first time home buyers who are also first generation home buyers. First generation home buyers is not defined in this bill, there is a piece of federal legislation that is proposed that discusses what a first time home, first generation home buyer is, but that's not law either. So that's one sentence is doing all those things within this program. So it's, it's creating a new definition or it's, it's not, it's, it's saying that we need to have a definition of what is, what a first generation home buyer is. It's, Utilizing what we heard from the ED of VHFA the other day was that it's, it's taking money that, if it's used as a grant, of course, then it's not recycled, recyclable in the way that a revolving loan fund mm -hmm. has been built. So it's taking funds out of that loan fund to be used for grants, but there's no further appropriation to increase the amount. To, to increase the amount in that fund. Yes. So, sorry, that's what it's, that's, that's at least two of the things that it's saying. Representative Murphy. I, I, if we're doing a walkthrough, it might be a deeper question than you want to ask. I just was going to connect it to earlier conversations we've had about potentially using ARPA money for some of this and the co concern that if it's ARPA money, it actually can't come back, it has to get spent. So I just don't know, but with no allocation tied to it, it's. Yes, but that's so for our work. Right. It's, the, it's the language that is in S211 or S210 about that that's been in our bill that's been in S79 about the about the $50,000 
second loan program. Right. Like there, that's out there. Um, I think we'll hear about the missing middle yeah. issues. So it just yeah. in terms of yeah. this part of the bill, those are all out there for us to yeah. talk about and hopefully solve. Uh, Representative Wall. I've got a question about uh, this lack of a definition for first generation home buyers. Uh, I wonder what a bureaucratic nightmare that could turn out to be. I mean, how do you document that your grandparents didn't own a home? Or, I, I'm so not sure how that's going to work. Yeah, like, how do you vet that? Well, we'll take we'll take testimony on again I, wherever it came from, and if it's apparent that we need to have a definition again, we that's a policy <clears throat> choice for us. But again, that's a phrase like to me it strikes me as a phrase as what is a new American? You know, yeah. Is that an immigrant or refugee? Is Workforce that, housing. You know, it just is like there's a there's a question of definition there that we'll wrestle with. Um, coming days. All right. Thanks, David. See, see, we're trying. I'm trying to prevent that, David. I'm trying to prevent that. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> We've made it all the way to page twelve already. <laughs> Fourth of the way through. Um, so. Uh, the next piece, section eight, man, that we're talking about manufactured homes now. And this is, um, uh, it's a total of $5 million. And these are <clears throat> ARPA funds that would flow through DHCD. And it's really in three pots. So the first one, this first $3 million for manufactured home community, small scale capital grants through which the department may award up to $20,000 for owners of manufactured housing communities to complete small scale capital needs, vacant lots with homes, and include projects such as disposal of abandoned homes, lot grading and preparation, uh, site electrical box issues upgrades e911 safety issues legal fees transporting homes out of flood zones individual septic system and marketing to help make it easier for home seekers to find vacant lots one million dollars is for manufactured home repair grants through which the department may award funding for minor rehab or accessibility projects coordinated as possible with existing programs for between 250 and 400 existing homes where the home is otherwise in good condition or in situations where the owner is unable to replace the home and the repair will keep them housed. And the last million dollars is for new manufactured home foundation grants, $15,000 per grant for a homeowner to pay for a foundation or HUD approved slab, site prep, skirting, tie downs, utility connections on vacant lots, within manufactured home communities. So that, yeah, that, that section eight, and that language is basically exactly as provided by DHCD, and I'll leave it at that. We're still 30,000 people. So the next section, section nine, you'll see was actually removed. So this is one of the pieces that appropriations took out. This would have increased the, uh, the amount of the, um, I forget which specific tax credit program this is, and I don't know why I can't ever remember. Um, but at any rate, it doesn't matter because it's removed, but it would have increased uh, by $250,000 um, and then I think this is also the affordable housing tax credit and and then allocated that 250 specifically for use for manufactured home purchase and replacement. So I, I believe the administration had proposed this concept since the beginning and it made it all the way to Senate appropriations and now is out. Any questions on that? Um, thank you. Just that I'm not sure it refers to manufactured homes because it's a separate section. I think it's all rental housing. Well, 
if you see on page 14, well, actually, it starts at the bottom of 13, mm -hmm. um, the very, on line 20 there, of the total first year credit allocations made under this subdivision, V B 250,000 shall be used each fiscal year for manufactured home purchase and replacement. Above that on line 17, not to interrupt you, it says including for new construction and manufactured housing. So I think it's probably inclusive of manufactured housing. I missed that. The, the, the increase, yeah, is to the total first year credit allocation for, so again, this is, it's, a, it's really kind of hard to follow in here because this is that series again of programs that function as tax credits because we have authorized these entities to sell credits out into the world to create this pot of money and then use the pot of money to administer the programs. And right now, it, it and so as you noted, the existing law is for both new construction and manufactured housing. There's also, so these are the affordable housing tax credits. And um, at any rate, so, so parts of these go for rental, part of these can go for new construction or homes, et cetera. But the addition of that second sentence um, pegs that new 250 just to manufactured. So it's that reservation of just the increased amount. So the program would have continued as it's currently constituted with the same amount of money for everything else that it already does. And then they were going to increase it by 250 just for manufactured housing. But again, that, that was removed in Senate appropriation. So that does not mean necessarily that this is dead forever, but it will go on their wall of asks and they will evaluate where to allocate what they feel like they have for money. Right, so when we consider this section, we're gonna consider, I mean, this is the policy, they strip their money out, right? Is, is that, so we can talk about the words and the policy, but we have no way of like judging the money right now. I mean, that's what's, in, there's, because there's nobody. What was stripped out of the bill was the money, right? Not the language. <laughs> this whole section was removed. Okay. With what, David? This whole section nine is removed in its entirety. Removed. So if the Senate passes this bill, this, this doesn't exist. That's right. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, page 14. Section 10, um, this uh, is Frankenstein's monster section. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for teeing that up so gently. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't want to like, I know you don't need the whole legislative history of how they got to where they got, but sometimes it's helpful for you to know. I feel like, especially if you've been paying attention to what's in these housing proposals all session long, so the way that this bill started its life as a housing bill, there were two proposals that are contained in section 10, and then a third was added to it, and then they were kind of combined, and now we have what we have. So it started with what you see here in uh, A2. I want you to see A2. So this is funding for matching grants, and that's up to $50,000 or 20% of employer costs for large employers with 50 or more employees that provide housing for their employees, okay? So this is a large employer housing matching grant program concept. If you turn to the next page, subdivision three, this is another allocation for matching grants. 50,000 or 20 percent of developer costs for projects that convert commercial properties to residential use. Okay, so those were each freestanding sections originally with five million dollars each. There were a lot of sections with five million dollars, basically one paragraph. And uh, they felt ultimately like, well, we don't have $10 million to do these two things. And in fact, they don't have any money to do these two things. So <laughs> They married those with what is now A1, and then it goes on further in B and C below. So 
VHCB came to the committee with this concept of this uh, neighborhood developments, computer, community partnership for neighborhood development, where they were going to take uh, all kinds of streams of funds flowing through transportation, natural resources, environmental and conservation, municipalities, VHCB, all kinds of people, and, and, and use these streams of funds and creative ways to do big neighborhood housing developments, 300, 400 units, right? And that, I think the white paper was talking figures like 60, $70 million. Um, they're just felt like, I guess, go ahead. This position paper exists somewhere? Uh, it is a proposal. You could find it on Senate Economic Development's website from okay. Gus Seelig. But at any rate, where we ended up with Section 10 is that VHCB is authorized to use $5 million that it already has for all three of these things. So it can use some of its funding for matching grants for large employer housing. It can use some funding for matching grants for commercial conversions. And it can use some of this funding to work with partners as outlined in the section to do these neighborhood development uh, projects. And so it, it's not mandatory uh, that they do any of these things, but they are authorized to do all of these things. So, and that $5 million that they're putting aside here on page uh, 14, the bottom of page 14, right? The line. Yep. Section A. So, the, what's that? So, that's what you just said is that for B, for one, two, and whatever. And the BHCB is authorized to use up to $5 million. We don't know if that, you said it's money that they already have. So it's it could be from their ARPA funds. It could be from their from from property transfer or housing conservation fund up to a certain point because not all that money could go to housing. But any of there's any of the many sources that it seems that there's that they've been receiving funds. I mean, they received you know they just got fifty five million dollars in funds from from BAA. So <laughs> now I represent Black and Murphy, but. I don't know how it all lines up, but it was in the governor's budget. There was $5 million additional that was allocated for this. And I don't know in, I don't know if it's for this. Again, this is something that we now put up on. Right. This is a question because it's, a, not, I don't know if it's already, they have it or it's additional. But anyway, that would be my question. Yeah. I was just going to query some of the language in here. And again, I'm not quite sure how deep we want to go in it, but just wondering, I don't see any limit that one employer couldn't receive the 5 million. If, I mean, the 50,000 is limit per unit. So if they built that many units, I mean, one employer could, and, and I know there's been news of a very large employer who is doing housing for employees. And I just, I'm just wondering, well, there's a number, there are a number. Yeah, so, and, and so just, just making note that, I mean, there's nothing to say how much of the share of this an individual or company or whatever could get. It could go all to one. Yeah, the, the first viable project should yep. gobble up the- Which may be okay. No, 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 totally. Yeah, but, it's, but it is- That's a point with the language. The whole yeah. five million could go to one thing, as far as I read it. Sure. It's just, I mean, we're- Yeah. I don't even know that we have to flag it. The whole exactly. Topic is flag. Yep. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So, um, all right. And this is this is a different program. This is the this is a part of a community partnership for neighborhood development. This has nothing to do with VHIP money or or missing right. middle money. No. Right. And and so and, and and can you can you illuminate perhaps the any discussion that may have been had or a description of what a project that convert commercial properties to residential use would be? Is that like turning a uh, former shopping mall into living units instead of a high school? Um, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> sure. I mean, people talk about 
you know, putting, mm -hmm. you know, putting apartments on top of <clears throat> old malls or whatever, you know, and so just not that we have it. Well, unfortunately, Rutland has a couple of areas mm -hmm. that are <laughs> in that category. Mm -hmm. We have two. two. Yeah, we have two big ones. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Sure. Where was that trial? Well, that was kind of my question. So um, there's apparently no definition as to whether or not this money can be used or should be used for rehab or new construction. That there's no, it's just open game. <laughs> yeah, we'll okay. safe to say. We'll, we'll safe. Yep. Okay. You're, you're safe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we can skip ahead to uh, the very bottom of page 16, municipal bylaw grants. And this carries us, this is an Ellen section um, that takes us through, you'll see the page 18, this new section of law, municipal bylaw modernization grants. And so uh, that's a new, I don't know if you all are familiar with these, but these are at the very basic. This is again an LN section, but the most basic level, this is money that goes to the municipalities to help them upgrade their, their go through the process of revising their bylaws, subdivision regs to you know uh, be more progressive and favorable to housing while also being responsible for planning and zoning and environmental sensitivities and smart growth, et cetera. Um, but all that said. Appropriations change this as well on page 21, so that uh, this originally had $650,000 for this grant program, and appropriations change section 13 to say, to the extent that increased funding is provided in FY23 to the planning fund, then they shall use 650,000 for the municipal bylaw modernization grants. So they're not actually giving them any money to do it. I'm just saying, <laughs> if we give you money to do it, this is how you should use it. Okay. <laughs> so I believe that there was, I believe in the budget discussions, there was, at least on the house side, there were conversations about increasing some part of municipal funding but I'm not sure if this is it or not. Yeah, those are the planning grants for, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I, you know, I know this doesn't make your jobs any easier, uh, but nor does it make ours any easier, that as the session progresses, the number of things that need to be finally resolved among multiple bills continues to increase mm -hmm. apace. Mm -hmm. So add this to the list. Are you saying that a holistic approach to build building is perhaps not the best? <laughs> you don't have to answer. That. <laughs> um, so, so going down then to section. Well, this is still part of section thirteen. Tax credits was formerly section fourteen. Yeah. So that uh, was part of the downtown tax credit programs which would have been uh, increase the allocation for NDAs and qualified projects under that program. This is an Ellen thing, and she magically appears. Oh. <laughs> yes, no, I'm sure. her. So Ellen, basically, we're going to let, at this point, we're going to let David finish the David sections and then have you back for the Ellen section. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> So we're we're all these tax credits are Ellen uh, credits because they are all you know within these designated downtown uh, areas which are hers. Um, so I'll let her do all of that all the way to thirty one. Let's just skip right ahead to section twenty four. Page 31. Um, so while not every section of this bill uh, enjoyed the benefit of a th thorough scrubbing of words uh, all of the time, um, towards the end of the process, this one did get, I feel like, some good fine tuning. 
and is a comprehensible program with parameters um, and limitations and definitions. And um, it's for middle missing middle housing. And you may be familiar with the concept of this one. This one you'll see in uh, section 24A here does actually have money. Um, $5 million in FY22 and $10 million in FY23. Those are ARPA funds. Um, I would, you know, if you have questions about the use of ARPA monies, I would uh, encourage you to invite Sarah Clark from JFO to come talk about it. But my understanding from them is that they feel comfortable with this use of ARPA funds because it is targeted at income eligible buyers and speaks to affordable housing issues, which under ARPA are, but it is a loan program or sort of, well, it's it's a, it's an interesting program. So let's look at it. Before you get, before you jump on out. I'll sure. Representative Clark, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, well, it's just, a, it's a, money question really is that by the time this bill passes year 22 is going to be over and in our budget adjustment this money was taken out of the house budget so yeah this is right so again the the, the idea of no, I, I, all these moving parts yeah, yeah. so it all right, so, two populations you need to know about here, affordable owner-occupied housing. So that's housing that meets the definition of affordable owner-occupied housing under federal law and under VHFA's programs. Mara can give you all those details. And then there's also income eligible home buyers. And those, so those are Vermont households pegged to 120% of AMI. So that's sort of the world we're talking about. And C, you'll see here VHFA has the authority to provide subsidies for new construction or acquisition and substantial rehabilitation of affordable owner occupied housing for purchase by income eligible home buyers, right? So there are limits in D, the total amount of subsidies not to exceed 35% of eligible development costs, and those would have to be planned out by VHFA. And the agency can allocate this subsidy between developer and home buyer. So when I started to say this a loan program, it's not really a loan, it's a subsidy program, but how it work, how it shakes out in the end depends on where it gets allocated and then what affordability mechanism they're used. So like a loan, the value kind of lives on in, the, in these housing units and in these developments. And that's really why I raised the whole point because unlike a grant with federal funds, this is something where we're trying to, you know, use that money over a, a longer period of time than ARPA necessarily is designed for. But I, I think it's okay, and JFO thinks it's okay. I just have to fly with that. So you'll see how this works in D1 and 2. The two subsidy com concepts or components. So the developer subsidy, the agency may provide a direct subsidy to the developer, which shall not exceed the difference between the cost of development and the assessed value of the home as completed. So some people have been calling this the value gap. Right, and it's really just the difference of what it actually costs to build the place versus what it's assessed at. And the concern here being that it costs more to build a house than the assessed value will cover in the end. And so VHFA has the ability to basically buy down the cost of building that house so that up to 35%, the as built, cost to the developer would equal out with the assessed value. Two, the home buyer subsidy anticipates that if they don't use all of that developer subsidy, they don't need the, to buy down that much, then they can give more money 
in that same project, still subject to that 35% project cap, to the home buyer to help the home buyer actually buy the house, right? So you have to be income eligible. Um, it will reduce the cost of purchase from the home and it'll be subject to A and B here. The agency would have to include conditions in the subsidy or use some other legal mechanism to ensure that the value of the subsidy remains with the home to offset the cost of future income eligible home buyers, or the agency uses a shared equity model that requires the agency to retain not less than 75% of any increased equity in the home. So we're talking here specifically about perpetual affordability, right? Somehow making sure that this subsidy that the buyer benefits from will, some part of that value will remain and preserve the home to be affordable into the future. So I'll represent a hang first. Just a quick question. So um, the, the, this letter A, does that apply to both home buyer and developer subsidies? Like if the, the developer uses the entire amount of the subsidy, right. how does that work with um, perpetual affordability? Well, then there's no more subsidy available to the home buyer. So it's use. only if the home buyer is subsidized that it comes back to the agency after that home buyer sells the home. <laughs> Yes, I mean the developers. The developer subsidy would go away. Would just that money would go to the developer. Period. Period. With no perpetual. No further. No further. The way this is yeah. sounding is that there's no further responsibility for anything else from that money that goes to the developer. But but <laughs> don't miss three. The agency shall adopt one or more legal mechanisms to ensure that subsequent sales of a home, of a home uh, that is subsidized through the program, are limited to income eligible home buyers. Right. So this is, this is. I mean, so the shared equity program is run by our nonprofit housing agencies. Very simply, just is is if a home costs two hundred thousand dollars. I know we're going back in time to. Mm -hmm. but the, um, so let's just use it as a number and fifty thousand dollars of that is subsidized through through this program to income eligible home buyers at some point they'll sell and the sale price might be three hundred thousand dollars the fifty thousand dollars stays with the house if i got this right i'm gonna and then and then the homeowner is allowed to keep a percentage of the built up equity and some of it stays with the house too. So that's kind of the, that's the way it works in the nonprofit model. Um, but that's for, that could be, this could be a smaller subsidy. Um, at any rate, that's just, that's just what we're looking at when we talk about not less than 75% of increased equity. Um, Representative Kalaki. Um, David, help me understand uh, the home buyer subsidy. Mm -hmm. Because earlier in the bill, this agency also has loans to low income eligible folks, as well as developing a grant program for first generation, right? And so how do, how do those loans and possible grants fit into this home buyer subsidy? So those, those are different programs. Um, could it be the same people? It, it could be, I suppose. There could be overlap. I, I don't, I mean, VHFA is going to have to structure this program. You know, you'll see down in E that they're going to have to come up with the application selection, the project criteria, other criteria for. It says le leveraging of other programs. Exactly. Good. Right. That's, so I think I that there could be. Uh, layering yeah. of, of assistance for sure. I, I, I don't, I mean, it's also possible that VHFA could say we either want to help you through this one or through that one, but not both. But it may, it may be their intention to say, let's give, yeah. let's give one person all the different streams and see how much we can help them. I, that's a Mara question. You know, do they want to divide and conquer? Do they want to aggregate resources for a single buyer? I don't know. Yeah, and what do we, Yes, we'll, we'll yep. be focusing on 
this will this will be a few hours of work. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, you're optimistic. <laughs> well, this has come a long way, so I, I guess I, I think it's interesting. Okay, so we're through. Are we through section E now? Um, I think so. Yeah, I, I just, I just do want to note about the perpetual affordability regimen that uh, on the. The legal side and in the management side, obviously this happens a lot already as far as working with partners and management of those affordability covenants over time. You'll see in subsection F that VHFA can assign its rights to VHCB or another nonprofit concerning these uh, covenants or the use of this these funds as long as the, the assignee acknowledges and agrees to comply with the provisions. So those mechanisms are all in place, and I assume that they would avail themselves of the existing infrastructure to manage those. But I just I do want to flag that, you know, over time, you know, ensuring that this house is always available to an income qualified person. That what does that drift look like after 20, 50 years? I don't know. Who enforces that still? Are all these organizations still around? Are we still do we have the inventory? What legal mechanisms do they use? And does that impact its likelihood of enforceability or being properly managed over time? I don't know. Right. That's that's the adoption of this kind of program, which nonprofit housing organizations already do. Right. Right. So if it goes through that model and you're working with a nonprofit, which is one option, probably assuming that nonprofit is healthy and will be around for hundred years, then it's probably likely they're going to manage it just fine. But there's the other possibility they use just some sort of covenant, let's say in the deed, that is an individual term and in, in that the enforceability is private and who knows? You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I mean it, like that for your consideration. Yeah. No, that's again, nonprofit housing agencies are going to have mechanisms for for what happens under the worst possible circumstances. I mean, that's just, a, that's how they're set up. But this program, while it parallels the concepts, doesn't have that structure behind it. Or it could, depending on what, what, what plays out. All right, so. Um, so page 34, residential construction contractors. I don't think we need to dig into this too deep. Uh, because you've seen this a lot, but there are two significant changes to this. And the first one on page 36, line seven, you will see that the threshold dollar value, both for requiring registration with OPR, and then later the threshold amount for a written contract have been increased to $10,000. So that's the one significant change well there's two changes and they're both significant that's one of them the other is the addition of a new concept and this starts at the very bottom of page 44 and that is section 29a it won't it won't always be section 29a but for right now it is and this, in this, so the body of this is on page 45. AG's office authorized to create one classified two year full time limited service position within the consumer assistance program, whose duty shall include reducing, resolving, assisting with consumer complaints concerning residential construction <laughs> projects with a value of less than $10,000, and coordinating and facilitating information sharing with OPR. There is money. $200,000 for this from the general fund to the AG's office to create this. So this position envisioned for two years, um, there's $200,000 for it. It's not envisioned to be an attorney position um, and appropriations allow this money to stay in. So it's, it's I guess, it's gonna be part of their budget for now. And you you still have this report in, that, in the next section, this January 24 report coming back. And the understanding is that 
Um, you know, part of what they're going to come back and talk about is the dollar threshold and the complaint ombuds person and is this whole thing working or not the way it's set up. So those are two obviously very significant shifts in the construction of the residential contractor registration regimen. Any questions on those? Uh, they'll uh, require testimony from Pat. And we had committee, we are expected to hear from Senator Sorokin tomorrow. Just gonna have it. <clears throat> so they'll be able to give us the political conversation. <laughs> the 10,000 Senator Brock's kind of. It, it, yeah, it was his amendment. This is a this has been a negotiation in the Senate. Okay, maybe higher than the Senate, but I don't know for sure what what the basis of this language uh, is. So that's what we take test. So my last couple pieces, thirty one and thirty two. Uh, Eagle term for these is a little bit wacky. You say that a lot. It's a legal term. I like say it in German. I haven't had Latin since eighth grade, but um, so uh, these two sections are purporting to amend. S210. Yep. Um, I got to talk to Janet for a yep. minute. Okay. Um, when David is done, can we take a, a, okay. a, a few minute break, yep. um, five minute break before Alan starts? Okay. Thank you. So, what's, what's weird about these, you'll see if you look on line six, so page 46, line six, section 31, right? Everybody with me? Yeah. Yep, yep. So this says section nine of S210 of this year <laughs> as enacted is amended to read. I didn't even Somebody know you could do that. Very yeah, it was Who's the guy that a crystal ball? <laughs> You're an optimist. Uh, That's all. I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm an agnostic. Is that the same thing? <laughs> I don't have enough knowledge to know whether or not this bill exists or whether it will pass. Yeah. But if it does um, pass, <laughs> we are now living in a theoretical. Okay. It will be amended as provided in these two sections. <laughs> That's wow. awesome. So, as you can imagine, at different points in time, S226 had the Vermont Rental Housing Investment Program and the Revolving Loan Fund in their entireties included in 226, even though it's already passed 210 in the Senate. Right. So uh, rather than include those again in their entireties in 226. They just said, let's let 210 continue to run its course, but let's make some <laughs> modifications to the rental housing investment program as it exists in 210. <laughs> so uh, add to the pile of things that you need to consider for the end game reconciliation. It, we have on page 46, starting on line 15. So this is the part about the Vermont Rental Housing Investment Program that talks about what we can use the money for. And what the Senate wants to do here is to provide additional dollars to create new accessory dwelling units. Um, so line 15 says you can, you can use the money to create an accessory dwelling unit it cannot be used as a short-term rental. And then down in D1, rather than have 30,000 per unit for both kinds of units, it bifurcates that and says, you can use up to 30,000 to rehabilitate an existing unit, or you can use up to 50,000 to create a new ADU. 
So that is obviously a change to the rental housing investment program as it was constituted in S210. On page 47, section sure. 30. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Representative Clark. Oh. Commissioner Hanford was in, in this committee this week, and um, he talked about the, also the possibility of the $30,000 of rehab an existing unit to look at increasing that up to $50,000 to accommodate larger families of um, re refugees moving into our state. And did the Senate also discuss that threshold of up to 50,000 if it was like more bedrooms? I, I did not hear yeah, that. Yeah, okay. but that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. Yes, I okay. just wasn't present. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so page 47, uh, it gets a little bit wackier and then we're done. So this is the $20 million that right now is appropriated in S210. So that's money hasn't actually been appropriated, obviously, because that bill has only passed the Senate. But if that bill passes, this purports to further amend the appropriations section as provided in section 32. So that of that $20 million, DHCD would have to allocate 25% of the funds for ADUs subject to A and B. So under A, department could use up to 20% of the funding to facilitate a statewide education and navigation system to assist homeowners with designing, financing, permitting, constructing accessory dwelling units. And B could use any remaining funds for accessory dwelling units for financial incentives or other financial supports to homeowners developing accessory dwelling units. So, You've got a program that allows for the rehabilitation of properties or the creation of new ADUs. You've got a $20 million appropriation that's supposed to be used for those grants or loans. And then you've got a modification that says you have to, you can use, no, you have to use 20% of that 20 million for ADUs in some fashion. That can either be up to 20 for this statewide education navigation concept, and then whatever is left of that for financial incentives or other financial supports. Not saying what that means, what those financial supports are. So there's a lot of flexibility with how that money could be used. Sure. The representative Clappy, then Hango, and then I wanna, I, I think that's the, with the exception of effective dates. I just wanna take a break now because we're all gonna have Ellen. For a little bit, we have we have more testimony at eleven on this subject, but I just, I just want to make sure Ellen gets a chance to to do the high. And or actually, we could committee. Do you mind not taking a break, and we can just work to like five of eleven or ten of eleven? Sure. Okay. I prefer you know? to take a break, and I don't need to ask my question. I'll ask Senator Sorokin. Okay. Um, so you would like to take a break now? I'll take a break. You all can keep working if you okay. want. Thank you. I, I, if I may ask one question about, about this. Um, so, so David, the VHIT program, as it's been rolled out, mm -hmm. has been eligible for, initially it was for those that were not housed. And then the next iteration was very low income Vermonters. That seems to be taken out of this in a way. And also adding this ADU completely shifts the, the kind of income framework of the original VHIP. I just want to make sure I'm, and I think in 210, the VHIP program still has income frameworks. <clears throat> this doesn't seem to have any, even for the, the rehabbing units. Am I reading this correctly? Um, not entirely. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. First off, um, the original program was not VHIP, and then there is, I guess, a VHIP the, the administration is using federal dollars for, but doesn't actually have a program. 
there actually is no VHIP. Um, and then this is the Vermont Rental Housing Investment Program, so VHIP, uh, that would be created in S210 that does have the income limitations that you're talking about. And then this would further modify okay. as provided here, if that is enacted. If that is not enacted, there is no Vermont Rental Housing Investment Program. There is no $20 million, and this is okay, uh, doesn't here. matter. Gotta stop for a minute. It's coming. Hey, well, are we still on? Yes, we are. Well, well <laughs> this the the we we accidentally unplugged the unit in here. Uh, and it's resetting from here, but but we're still live and you can still hear us. I see the stream. I'm just watching the stream now. Uh, it says there's 20,000. This doesn't matter if. Uh, if you stop the mute, are we still on? Yeah, it seems to be working. Okay, well, this, this, our, our little panel here says it cannot connect to the Zooms, but I'm not going to argue with it. Um, All right, I'll uh, send a note. Do you want to just take a break now and I'll send it to IT? <laughs> <laughs> All right.